Uh, yes, thanks, Daniel, for the introduction. So it was one of those things with introductions. You, sometimes you don't know what they're going to say about you and they bring up childhood stories and things. So it's always very nervous when you're standing there. So, oh, I remember when he was a... So anyway, I'm glad. So uh, yes, it's also another thing about giving these lectures is you do the first thing you do is to survey the crowd. So, you know, coming from an academic background, you really wonder whether do I pack myself here for a public lecture or pack myself here or pack myself somewhere in between. So I'm glad tonight's crowd is, is great. So it's like, you know, sometimes you get family groups, you got kids and everything that you can really scratch your head and think of how to keep these people entertained for the whole evening, right? But today, I guess it's, it's easy uh, and it's an in the evening and I will be entertaining you, I hope, for the next hour or so. And we're going to talk about content. But before I do, this is one of those places which I have to ask. I, maybe I'm cheeky, but I just have to ask. How many of us here, by a show of hands, have been to Banten? Oh, that's quite not too bad. That's excellent. I'm, 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 I'm very impressed. So that's a, you know, a good 5% of the people here, which is, is, that is great. So, okay, the rest of us, those of us who have been to Banten, obviously know about Banten. How many of us, before coming to this talk, heard about Banten? That's not bad, half of us. So that's, that's great, that's good. So I guess it, we'll, we'll, we'll try to, as what Daniel said, weave in a few stories, weave, weave in a bit of the archaeology, weave in a bit about the historical sources. And I'll try my best to weave in a few of the, the thematic uh, elements that we have in the exhibition downstairs and try to point out a few of these uh, artifacts that are on display, Ma mainly, well, I won't say artifacts, but mainly like documents and uh, publications that are on display as well. So great, so let's talk about Banten. So I'm sure that we have seen uh, something like this. Is this, is this Okay for you guys. It's not too bright. Well, I was wondering whether we can turn off these um, the front lights over here so you get a better view, uh, if it's possible. Otherwise, don't worry about it. So Bantan, you've probably seen uh, uh, European uh, illustrations of this uh, fabulous kingdom illustrated. In this case, in color. Uh, there's a copy downstairs if you are interested. It's in black and white, but that's the original. So why Bantan and why? Why, why, why did all these Europeans, particularly the East India companies, the different different East India companies, the Dutch East India company, the English East India company, the French East India company, the Danish East India company, the Swedish East India company, the Austrian East India company? I'm surprised, right? The people will say that what? Oh, there are so many East India companies. There are many of these, and most of them actually set foot on Banten. So why did they come all the way to the far east, to the eastern archipelago? Well. Spice, that's right, and particularly for Bantan pepper. Bantan was the pepper kingdom of the uh, island uh, archipelago. And well, that's a rough uh, at its peak, maybe around 1700. Bantan produces about four and a half thousand tons. So that's 4,500, right? 4,500 tons of pepper. And if we look at the estimates of uh, in 1700, of what the Dutch East India Company is in, uh, exporting to Europe, to Holland, that's only about 6,000 tons. So Bantan is really producing the most of it. And they're producing all this pepper, not just for the European market or the American market, the New World, but also for the Chinese market. We have good Chinese records that says about, that talks about pepper as far back as the 14th century. And they talk about buying pepper from Southeast Asia, or maybe from Aceh, maybe from Sumatra, or later from Bantan. And the Chinese are consuming about between anywhere from 500 tons to 1,500 tons. So this, this data is a bit, uh, well, it's, it's, well, I would say that it's not iffy, but it's hard to really pinpoint. But you're looking about a lot, right? 500 tons is a lot for, for pepper. And how does 500 tons for pepper uh, is like? Well, imagine this room. How much do you think we can fill? Take a guess. There's a lot of prizes there. I think there's tea and coffee. Right? <laughs> well, we need about... 500 of these rooms, just that. Yeah, of course you can stuff everything in there, but no, they put it in the bales, you got to keep sure that they're dry and everything. So we do need a lot of them, right, for 500 tons. So this is the type of, a volume of, uh, of pepper that the Chinese, only the Chinese were consuming uh, during the Ming Dynasty and later in the Qing Dynasty, right? So where exactly is Banten? Well, I'm glad that people have been there and you heard about the place, but just in case, that's Bantan in, in West Java, well, Singapore is right here. So right on the, the coast of the Sunda Straits, so the main straits uh, traveling between East and West, uh, Malaysia from India uh, down to Singapore and go up towards China and Japan and the other straits, uh, Sunda Straits. Uh, here's uh, more 
recent map of, uh, of the province of Bantan. Uh, so after the, the Duhato's government has collapsed, uh, this, this became an independent province with a lot of autonomy. So it, more or less, it's, it's, it's about, this, about the size of the kingdom back 500 years ago. So where we are looking at, it's on this tip, the city itself, uh, Old Bantan or Bantan Lama, uh, is right here. And this nice little bay where the harbour is. Uh, well, this map doesn't show Sumatra, but you can see this little bits of island here. That was Karakatoa, which uh, the, the island that blew up, right? That's the, the volcanic island that blew up in 1883. Uh, so here's the Sunda Strait, and it's very close uh, to, to uh, southern Sumatra. Here's a, a 19th century navigational chart of, of that area. Uh, you can see again Karakatoa uh, just after the explosion, so, right? And that's Bantan itself right here, this little tear, unfortunately. So that's the Bantan city itself. Uh, and that's Bantan Bay. And you can see why Bantan flourish as a port uh, city or port settlement. It's because of this big bay. So it, you know, even despite the explosion and, and the Karakatoa, the tsunami didn't really reach it over here because it's, it's, uh, it's very well protected by this bay. And likewise, why Jakarta became, or Batavia became a very, very prominent port it's because of the bay. So this is another bay here, the Bay of Batavia or Jakarta. Right, so what do we really know about the, the chronology of Bantan? So as an archaeologist, we like to work with dates, right? We like to find out how old it is, or where is it from. Uh, so here it says a quick list of uh, the, the, the short list of, of, of the chronology of, of um, Bantan, or, or otherwise spelled as Bantam. You might have come across this other spelling instead. Um, and we really don't really know when this port entity existed. The earliest doc, uh, record that we have was from a Portuguese record that mentions about uh, some sort of port, a port settlement there around the 1500s. So that's the earliest record that we have of it. And uh, surprisingly, the Okinawans as well, uh, people from Ryuku, they actually came by here to Su uh, Sunda Kalapa, or that's the old name of even the older name for before prior to Batavia. So they, they mentioned that there was another port to the east as well. So there's some references to it, but we don't really know exactly what, what's there. Then uh, later on, uh, this is a big if, uh, if as well, there's a big question mark there. Around the, the mid-1520s, around 1525, thereabouts, um, one of the famous uh, uh, 12 wadis of um, Islam, the 12 this prominent saints, Islamic saints, who, who spread Islam throughout the, the archipelago. One of them uh, and his son conquered this old polity and established this new kingdom or new sultanate. So we're not exactly sure when precisely, but most people think it's around you know, the mid-1520s. Uh, then, of course, later, the Dutch East India Company uh, became part of uh, the British, um, British Java for a short while. And the sultanate uh, survived all the way until the early 19th century, or well, sort, of, sort of the early contemporary of uh, Singapore in the early 19th century. So, right, so here's a quick description of uh, how a, a European trader or merchant would have witnessed how a Vantan was like. So it's a fabulous experience for these, these, uh, these, these European traders. And this, this account in 1598 was with um, the very first Dutch, uh, um, Dutch fleet that visited uh, the, the archipelago. So this is the very first time they came, they came to Bantan. And it describes in this way that all sorts of people with the various nationalities. You know, you have Portuguese, Arabs, Turks, Chinese, Kalings, the Pagus, the Malay, Bengali, so etc., etc., etc. So, et cetera, et cetera. so it, it's after its founding around circa 1525, mid uh, 1520s, it started to become very cosmopolitan and very, very popular. That it's famous enough that the, Jad, the Dutch knew that this is a place they have to go to get pepper. Buy pepper at the source. Why buy it uh, through, the, through, the, through the, the, the Italians or through the, the Arabs or through the, the Gujaratis to come to its source? And this is the very, very first stop that they made in, in the archipelago. There are a few historical sources. I'm a historical archaeologist, meaning that I tread both world of history and archaeology. So I use uh, documentation, uh, use other sort of illustrations and maps as well. And of course, the artifacts to try to piece together the past. 
So historical sources, uh, fortunately, we have an indigenous account. It's called the Sejara Bantan, a bit like our Sejara uh, Melayu in, in sense for Singapore. It's sort of written in the 17th century. Uh, it talks a bit about the founding myths of Bantan. So, but the problem with, with these, um, these uh, indigenous accounts, they tend to be written much later when, when the Sultan was really, was really well established. Uh, by most scholars' uh, account, we believe that it's around the, the mid 17th century. Uh, the surviving example is actually much later. Uh, from, from the 18th century, but it, it has a date there that is copied from something earlier. So most people think that it's written uh, during the reign of uh, uh, Sultan Agong and talks about how the lineage and everything that. So there's a lot of this mythology behind it, and from it we extract a little of uh, some information. Well, that unfortunately or unfortunately, we have a lot of European accounts uh, for, for some reason, as we can start from Portuguese. Uh, you got the Dutch, so you have various accounts like earlier. We have um, the, the first uh, VOC, a Dutch East India Company fleet in uh, 1596. We have that account of those guys when they went back, they published their diaries and they became very famous and they sold quite a bit of their publication. They went into many reruns or reprints. Uh, we also have Chinese documentation and of course uh, it's, uh, the other East India Company records. Uh, I'm just going to go very briefly, so don't really bother. I know it will bore people with a lot of text here, but there's a few quick, quick, um, quick dates that we should at least keep in mind as we talk later. As we show, I'll show you all the more exciting pictures about the site itself, about the things that we find. There's a few uh, dates that I've highlighted here to keep in mind. So we know that you know in about 1525, this roughly circle was established around that time. The Dutch appeared about uh, 70 years later, and that's where we start getting a lot of description for, uh, about the Bantan as a city, about as a settlement, as a society, about the way, the, about the economy, about the politics. Um, one of the few things that most people forget, <laughs> or maybe not aware of, is the British or the English East Indian Company, uh, which founded Singapore, of course, had their very first factory in the Far East at Bantan. So that's again, the very first stop for them was to be uh, uh, arrived at Bantan. And they managed to persuade the Sultan to allow them to set up a, a trading station or factory there. So they literally had a compound there in 1602. So the Dutch actually arrived there earlier uh, compared to the English, but they weren't really on that great terms with the, with the people of the Bantanese. And it's only a year later that they managed to persuade the Sultan to allow them to establish a trading lodge. Uh, and well, I did mention their relationships not so good. So at some point, uh, they were they were forced or actually asked to quit the Bantan in 1619, and they move uh, eastwards and establish their own factory there in, in Batavia, or Jakarta, right? And you can see that their 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 relation really really soured with with the Bantanese. So over the next uh, 20 30 years, there was a constant Dutch blockade to try to try to squeeze this uh, the economy of Bantan and divert all this uh, uh, maritime traffic to Batavia. Uh, another date which I highlighted uh, here is uh, the 1680 uh, Civil War. So this is a very, very, it's a very important turning point for the history of Bantan. This is the point where, well, it's one of those things when you, I suppose you have too many descendants. Uh, yeah, that's the thing, I right? stop at two, right, to listen to. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of those things. We have too many descendants, and at some point, the Sultan Agong had a disagreement with his heir apparent, and then you know, so so the usual story. You know, the, the the son tried to overthrow his father, and one of them supports. Uh, decided that he needed to invite the Dutch to support him militarily, uh, and that's when the Dutch really established a real good foothold. And uh, when Daniel mentioned one of the treaties, the 1691 treaty with the next sultan was installed, they had all these contracts establishing monopolies for, for the Dutch. And we talk about pepper, right? So what was one of the, what, one of the, the conditions that they have for this military aid uh, was uh, they were to expel all other Europeans from Bantan, sell pepper only to the Dutch at 15 views per 400 kilos or something like that, right? So about 400 kilos and you sell them at 15 reels. So this is a fixed price for the next 300 years. So there's this, you know, you're sort of giving up. Uh, don't, 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 don't be mistaken. It's not like, wow, the poor Sultan, well, he, he got a short end of stick. Not really. 
The Sultan buys it between three and seven reals, silver, right? Silver dollars per 400 kilos. And he's selling at 15. That's still a pretty decent profit, I think, right? So, but still, you can see slowly the Dutch is moving. Is, the incursion is there. The, the, the authority is being stamped onto the, 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 the various Sultans that followed. Right, so going on ahead. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we're coming to the end of the boring part. So let me just finish this. I, I, I like pictures too, so I'll show you what's what later. So here we are, so just, just briefly going through, uh, I also mentioned a few of these, um, uh, like a, like a Valentin. So he visited Van Tan. Uh, I've mentioned a few of these visitors. There's a lot, a lot of visitors, a lot of Europeans that, and also Asians that visited Van Tan and left accounts of it. But these are the few more prominent ones, which you, even today you are still able to find their, their accounts. And of course, most of them are on, ex, on exhibition, uh, on display downstairs. So you can go have a look at the, the accounts and the illustrations and drawings. Right, so fast forward, 1750, so about another 75 years later after the Great, uh, the great Civil War, there was a big rebellion. Again, it's, it's, it's one of those things when you have too many dissentants. So uh, one, one of the, 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 the consorts, the queen, um, she, she's Arabian, and uh, she, of course, wanted to have her own faction to support a, a, a certain lineage. And conveniently pers pers uh, persuaded the Dutch to support her to install her, her child as, as the sultan. But... Because she's a foreigner, in a sense, that's uh, one of these, uh, these things, uh, a rebellion occurred. And it took about three years before this rebellion was stamped out again with the help of the Dutch. And after this rebellion, new treaties were signed, right? So that's again, they lose a lot more properties, they, they lost a lot more uh, authority. And slowly you can see from the 1750s onwards until 1808 when the Sultanate was almost stamped out. And it's really in, in Raffles' uh, uh, hands in 1813 when he was the lieutenant governor of Java that the final uh, sultan of uh, Bantan surrendered his claims to his territories for a return and a pension. So, so, so in a nutshell, you can see how, how the rise and fall of, of this, uh, this, this kingdom. Uh, but we are interested in what's exactly inside the kingdom, right? So here we again, again we, we look at one of the earliest accounts in 1598 during the first fleets. Uh, so you can see all sort of people. It's very cosmopolitan, and they talk about all sort of things they were buying. Um, different people here we have here we talk about Persians, the Arabs, the Pagus, the came by sea, the Chinese merchandise. There's a lot of exchange going up. Like pepper. Uh, then to specifically talk about how they were investing things, the, the Malays and the Klings would invest money in, in bottomry, and this is, a, this, this is quite an obsolete term, but it, it basically means that you sort of pledge your ship or your cargo or even your person uh, in turn for uh, cash right now to a loan. Uh, if you are familiar with what's that, the Merchant of Venice, what's his name, the Italian guy, Antonio, and, and Shylock and Antonio, right? Antonio was the merchant with the three ships, and he sort of pledged his ships and borrowed money from Shylock, right? And yeah, incidentally, written around the same time, uh, Merchant of Venice is written around what, 15, 1596 or 1599 or thereabouts, right? So it's about the same time. So, yeah, so this was the practice at that point. Yes, account about 100 years later. So, this is, remember, the few key dates, right? So, this is, uh, this was the first contact. You know, this is a very valuable uh, sultanate, you know, very powerful, very rich, you know, when the first contact, when the first arrived around 1600. 100 years later, this is after the, the Great Civil War, right? So now Sultan Agong versus his son, Sultan Haji. But despite that, what, 20, years, uh, 20 years after that Civil War, Bantan was still very rich. And if you look at the description here, it's, it's, it's quite fabulous. And this guy, um, they, they actually talk about here we are. The Sultan was accompanied by four Ambonese, carrying bucklets and swords, followed by Javanese, uh, Balangas, and all sorts of people. And then he was carried on a chair. And this is only the prince, one of the prince, you know, a young prince. And then the procession continued, the young prince attended by hundreds of women. Wow. And each carrying beautiful ornaments, golden cups, flowers, and fruits in their hands. A company of Dutch followed. Now the Dutch soldier themselves, the soldiers are stationed in, in Bantan were part of the procession as well. So they were escorting the Sultan. And finally, he appeared, bumptiously attired, the Lord of the Universe. Well, these are wonderful descriptions. I guess descriptions like, like these, when it went back to Europe, this fired people's imagination, right? So they said, who are these, 
who are these mysterious Eastern princes with all this loads and loads of money and selling pepper and spice? What's going so they have all this imagination. And so here, uh, uh, the publisher Van der Ah in, 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 uh, in early 18th century, uh, but I think none of us in this room really believe that this looks like Bantan. It always reminds me of my, my trip to Kathmandu, and you know, so rather than Bantan, but you, you get this very fantastical type of, type of description of Bantan. I don't know, what is this, right? So, but anyway, some sort of palanquin or something. So different people, different hats, different, you know, Chinese, I think some Chinese are over here. Also the characters here is a little elephant. So just to show it how cosmopolitan and how fabulously wealthy uh, Bantan was. Bantan was one of the few Southeast Asian states, the earliest, one of the few earliest ones who sent an uh, embassy to, to London. So just at the, the big uh, civil war, an uh, embassy was sent to London. So several of these, uh, these Bantanese uh, Orankaya and princes went out there. So uh, Europe suddenly seen this Bantanese for the first time and with all their wealth and, 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 and pomp and circumstance. So here we are, a uh, uh, little map again of uh, Valentine. Uh, earlier, I showed you another source, a different rendition in, in color. Um, it's dated in 1726, that's the year it was published. You, you can go downstairs, have a look at it. Uh, but I, I really seriously think that this, this map is, is obviously based on a much earlier uh, plan or map of, of, of Bantan itself, probably the mid uh, 17th century, 1650s, that's about. But well, there's a few clues. Over here, it actually says that this is the English factory. So we know after the Great Civil War, the the, Bantan, uh, the, the, v, the Dutch East Indian Company uh, chased out, expelled all these people as part of the contract, right? So the, the English no longer had this uh, factory over there. And there's Chinatown is right here. Um, the, you can't really see it, but here's the, the palace and the great mosque, with the tower, the minaret. I'll show you in the detail in a bit. And some of you may have seen this. This is very, 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 very famous and it's very popular. It's, it's always been reprinted by so many different publishers, uh, even in the, in, the, in the 18th century. And today, of course, people just rip it off all the time. If you just look on the internet and on Wikipedia, you can find 20 different versions of it. And it's quite fun looking at the different versions. It's almost like spotting the mistakes, <laughs> right? Because here is a, here's a, the, the, this is accurate description of the bazaar, the market in Bantan. So if I show you, this is a bit more detail. So what's the big mistake, right? So the, it's a mirror image, right? So the, the publisher didn't even realize that it's in, in the reverse image, right? It's sort of cropped. So yeah, but there's also these, but it's lots of details. Fortunately, you know, the earlier what it was in Italian, uh, this, is, this is by, uh, 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 this is just published uh, when, when during the first, uh, the first voyage. So, let me see. Hmm. Sorry, it's not coming out, but I'll just, I'll just read it out. I initially, for some reason, the animation is not working, but all these little boxes will, will portray to show you which activity is happening. Uh, over here, I believe this is pepper, so they're selling pepper over here. Uh, if my memory doesn't fail me, this, this, this is a bamboo seller, here's a coconut seller. Uh, then these are cloths for possibly women, I think, a women's cloth. And another group of them, I don't know why they're in the circle, here's another one for men's cloth. And lots of, you see, rows and rows of shops, right? Or these war rooms, the little kind of kiosks are selling sort of different things. They have also all sorts of merchandise that are being sold there from all over the archipelago and all over the world. So people are bringing things from, you know, from France, from, from Holland, from India, from Japan, and they're all trading in, in this port. Okay, so we, finally we're getting to more, the more sexy stuff. Um, map, again, I love maps. Uh, so here's a late uh, um, 17th century map of Bantan. Uh, don't pay attention to details. Uh, it just make you cross-eyed. But just follow my, my pointer. Observe the boundaries of the port. So this is looking north. This is Bantan Bay, right? So here is a, Bantan itself, even today, it's, 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 it's sort of a, the, the Bantan River, or Chi Bantan, sort of runs through the, the city uh, through the town. So it splits into a, a little estuary to the east. There's one estuary going out. So there's a, one of the harbors or ports is on this estuary. And the other harbor or port is on, on, on this estuary. So that's on two sides, east and west, right? But just, bear, just, just, just put this into, burn this into memory. Let's just try to remember the outline of this uh, settlement. So fast forward uh, uh, 500 years later. So this is uh, Google Earth imagery in 2009. It's not really that updated, but 
10 years ago at least, look at the settlement. It's pretty much still very much the same. So here's the river, and it runs through the town itself. So this is the east, and this is the western port. It's still very active, right? And all the silting over the years, over the last 500 years, have sort of moved the shoreline about a kilometer north now. So there was the original shoreline you can really see from, the, from this aerial photograph, right? From the satellite imagery. It used to be somewhere around here, right? So still very much the same. So Bantam is, in a sense, it's, it's an archaeologist's dream because it's, it's really relatively untouched, right? You have no new shopping mall or subway station or, or Starbucks or, you know, whatever. But this is perfect. So Bantan is about um, just slightly under 100 kilometers from Jakarta to the west. If you take the main toll road going, going west, you can't miss it, uh, towards the, the, the provincial capital, Serang. Uh, if you take one of those airport express or you go to or the Serang Express, it's like a $5 bus ride. And you can just tell the bus driver or the coach driver to drop you off at the junction before it makes a, to a north turn. And take one of these tiny angkots, which is you know, this, this is one of the great treasures of, of, of Indonesia. You know, for like you know, 20 cents or 2,000 rupees. At least 10 years ago, it was 2,000 rupees. I, I don't know about inflation now, but, but 2,000 rupees. And then you can take the 15-minute ride into Bantan. So this is how it looks like going into what's Bantan. And it's still lined with all these warungs and tech huts. So very much the same, right? So in a way, I'm, I'm sort of live, reliving my fantasy of how, how it would be like when all these Dutch and European and Chinese and Japanese mercenaries when they first came to Bantan. Well, in a sense, it's still very much the same. And when you, you look around, uh, uh, Bantan today is surrounded by sawa, all these rice paddy fields, and it, in, from historical document, documents as well, and from uh, archaeological investigations over the years. It has been traditionally uh, rice fields and further, further away the, the pepper fields. Uh, increasingly over the years, uh, there's, a, there's a small industry of um, uh, bird's nests, right? So all these swallows and uh, uh, bird's nests, uh, well, structures uh, have popped up in Bantan, right? So these are probably the, the most recent development that has uh, disrupted the landscape. There is a small site uh, museum uh, very, very tiny, it's quite quite pleasant, and built in the 80s, so it's a little it's a museum site too, so it's a site museum. Uh, and in it, they, they, they've displayed quite a number of archaeological materials that uh, have been uncovered over the years, uh, including some of them that we, we have excavated. Uh, so I'll just, just show you a few, few, few items. Uh, so we're not so sure about the port of this Bantan prior to it becoming a sultanate, right, in 1525. So there were some archaeological evidence to show that there was something there earlier, like uh, this Nandi, uh, this um, Hindu Buddhist uh, 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 statue. You know, Nandi is across the sacred bull, the, the vehicle of Shiva, it was found in the river in the in the in the western uh, eastern river, uh, sorry, western river of um, uh, of Bantan. Uh, so it does predate to the Sultanate arrival. So this possibly was part of the, the port of the, the Hindu Buddhist kingdom of, of West Java. Uh, one of my friends, you can see the size of the pottery. So these are all made locally. The local industry uh, were, were quite active as well from the early Bantanese period uh, on, and continue until today. There's still a very big uh, ceramic industry. And one of my favorites is this little piggy bank. <laughs> so they actually have a, you know, this a 16th century piggy bank. They actually make this little piggy bank to store your money. Um, and Bantan is, has, Many ruins from the Sultanate period that littered the entire uh, entire district uh, town or village today. Uh, there is a Chinatown, uh, Pachinan, on the eastern side of uh, the uh, town. So here's the shoreline, the old shoreline. Now looking north, that's about one kilometer towards the coast. Uh, you can still see the river, uh, not very clear, but you can see this tree line that's part of the river that's very, very badly silted up. It goes up over here, so that's the, the eastern port. And here we have the western port, the river on, on the other side. So here, uh, another zone right here that's, that's uh, oh, sorry, next slide. So yeah, so Chinatown, the, uh, well, allegedly this is the oldest uh, Chinese townhouses in, in Bantan. Uh, it's, it's a bit hard to to ascertain, uh, different people claim different things, and you ask 
all these architectural historians, I mean, a lot of my colleagues, when I ask, check with them, one guy will tell you that it's from the 17th century, another one will tell you it's from the 18th century. So we, we are not really sure, but I, I think because it's difficult to tell, so over the years, they have been, you know, uh, remodeling it and renovating it, so it's a bit hard to tell. But these were the two structures that still remains that purportedly dates as early as the 17th century. Well, I suspect that it might be, you know, late 18th century. <clears throat> Uh, here's a, a little site which I, I pointed out within the Chinatown. There, there apparently was a Chinese mosque, right, which dates to the 16th century. Uh, now it's, it's in ruins. The minaret still stands. And here, so Chinatown is right here. Yeah, here's a little mosque at the minaret. You can see it right there. So the, on the western harbor, over there, and we have um, the Karanguta Harbor. That's where they found the, the Nandi. The, the bull, the sacred bull. Uh, here's the, the main feature of, 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 of Bantan today, or even back then, in the center of the town uh, was the Soloasan Palace, or is Soloasan Palace. Uh, here we look at the river. Uh, it's still active, it's still used as a fishing port, so all these little uh, prahus, motorized now, of course, uh, comes in and they still sell their, their catch from the, the ocean. Uh, and you can see it's still a marketplace, still very vibrant. Uh, the earlier marketplace, you know, the great marketplace of Bantan, which I showed you the different description in the, in the 16th century and 17th century, effectively, it's in this location. So this is where that marketplace is, it's surrounded by Paga and everything. Uh, the, if you really take away the electrical cables and uh, maybe the PVC tops and the corrugated iron, uh, it's very, very much the same as how uh, Anderson would have seen it in the 19th century when he described how these little, uh, this little, Little huts on jambans or toilets so built over the, the, the river. So it's a traditional in that sense. And anyway, when you look back today, it's like, I don't think it'd be very, very that much different from how the first Europeans, uh, when they first came here in 1596, that you have seen. This would have been an avenue. They would have taken their, their, their large galleons, large ships would have anchored off in Bangkok, uh, Bantan Bay, of course, and they would take these little prahus or these little lighters to come in. And they would come in through this little, <clears throat> this little port. Right, so Solor Sun Palace, the center of, 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 of uh, <clears throat> the city. And looking northwards, uh, <clears throat> just to the north of it is, is the King's Assembly Ground, Alun Alun. It's a big square. Uh, we have quite a few good detailed depictions. I, I actually have a few more. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find them, but they have very, very nice depiction or illustration from the 17th and the 18th century. On, on the Alun Alun, the square. But here's one from 1645 showing the governor of Bantam, the old spelling, <clears throat> sitting down at Alun Alun, meeting his uh, holding court and meeting the people. And here from the minaret, looking at south, uh, south, southeast, uh, here's Slow Swan Palace. You can see the palace there. Here's Alun Alun, the big meeting ground. And here's uh, Gunung Karang, looking in the distance, uh, looking south in that way. Another view of the Alun Alun. Uh, tradition has it that uh, one of these stones, the Watu Gilang, and there's two of these Watus, two of these big <coughs> boulders, uh, very nice polished, and they're, they're set in the Alun Alun as the, the throne or the, the meeting place for the, the seat for, for the, the Sultan or the King of Bantan. And this is where he will hold hearings from the public, and people can come out and give him uh, you know, missive and petitions and stuff. And he will hold his, his uh, assembly here. But well, tradition says that once these uh, stones were removed or were destroyed, the, the, the sultanate would have collapsed. But I guess it restored the sultanate. It's still there. It's still it's protected now by the, the conservation office. There's a little barrier around it. But it's still sitting there. Uh, according to Sajara Bantan, it's, it's one of those early pieces that were set in place from the, from the mid-16th century onwards. Now, looking at the great mosque of Bantan, the Masjid Bantan, so the palace is here, the Alun Alun, and just to the east of the Alun Alun, the SMD area, uh, is the mosque. And this mosque has been depicted in all illustrations. We, we can't miss it. You can see the little minaret and tower right there. Uh, here, this, this built here structure. Sometimes people refer to the palace, but I think it is proximity and location. It, it, it is actually the mosque itself. You can see it. Uh, since we're on this uh, illustration, we can, we can tell you're yeah, here. Looking um, southwards, uh, here's the, the Eastern River. Uh, 
that's the probably the English uh, East India Company factory there and Chinatown further ahead. There should be another river going here, probably it's not depicted on this image. So up to the 19th century, there are a lot of this wonderful um, um, uh, antiquarian prints are showing the, the, the mosque. And I, maybe it's just for me, maybe because I'm an archaeologist and you, you do feel kind of uh, this uh, nostalgic for the past in, in a sense. I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a, the, one of those nature of the process, uh, the, your prof uh, profession. But look at this. <laughs> they feel very much the same, right? So of course they renovated, they replaced the roof and everything. But you know, this is like when you really think about it so superficially, it's still very much the footprint. It's, it's, it's exact. The minaret still there. The minaret, are, uh, again, according to the Sajara Bantan, was built during um, what one uh, built built around the 1570s or thereabouts. So it might be one of the oldest standing structures in, in Java. Another view of the minaret, and from the minaret, you can actually see all this uh, surrounding the mosque, the great the mosque of Bantan, with all these little warungs and, and all these uh, little shops setting up their little, uh, you know, these bamboo poles, and they put a tarp over it. So this is the avenue leading up to the, to the, to the mosque over here, uh, the Alun Alun, and here's the um, Siloswan Palace, the big palace is right there. And you can see all these lures and little shops. So every time when I go by there and I look things, I say, you know, how different is it f f compared from you know, someone from the 16th century? The only thing missing is that I don't have my sword or my chris, you know, but you know, by my side, I don't have a man of arms following me or the or my uh, retainers or female retainers, of course, right? So, <laughs> so yeah. So how different can it be? Well, unfortunately, it's it's very different now because uh, just last year, uh, those of you who've been to Bantan would know that the uh, there's this big project which is from the local government, uh, the project uh, revitalize, revitalize, right? revitalization of Bantanama and the Alun Alun and the big square around the area. It's been turned into a nice big square. They, they use a lot of, host lot of activities and host a lot of things. Uh, but it's been no kind of a rebranding and repackaging of, of, of Bantanama, right? So here, you know, it's called you know, Kraton Soroswan. Here, the palace is there. So it's a bit like, you know, I am Amsterdam, the, the, the big image, right? So you, it, it lights up at night even, so I, I don't have a picture of it. So I stole this from the, uh, the Sarang post, so you can see his nice little walkway and everything. So it's, yeah, it's kind of hipster type of thing now, right? So, so very different from the warungs of you know, two, 2010s and 1600s, right? So a bit different. You know, but the warungs and the things are still there. They just move away from, from the center. Right, so here, Tambak, the fish farm. So, yep, all, all these uh, silting has been going on for the last 500 years. Uh, 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 um, the, the geoarchaeologists in the 80s, when they were doing the Indonesian geoarchaeologists were doing work, they estimated that uh, the river silt uh, that has deposited has, uh, at, you know, it's sort of creeping northwards by about four meters a year. So over time, it's so sort of, yeah, uh, But tambaks are great because uh, now in the past, remember this was Bantan Bay, right? So uh, sorry, this was Bantan Bay, right? So the ships would be anchored, would have been anchored here, and then they'll take in the small prahus to come up, right? Correct. So the ships would be just be anchored right there, the big galleons, the big cargo vessels. So now for me, I'm, I'm not an underwater archaeologist, since I'm a terrestrial archaeologist, I can just walk out to the sites, right? So they're no longer anything buried in the ocean, the ships sank in the ocean, you've probably seen a lot of pictures, but now I can just walk out there and dig. And it's true, if you look around the Tanbak, there's lots and lots of uh, artifacts, so all these ceramics, you know, these are like 18th century Chinese ceramics and Japanese ceramics, so they're all over the place. Uh, artifacts are everywhere. It's, it's almost like a, uh, yes, this is just behind someone's house, right? Someone's little thing. So you can imagine, right? So yes, wow. So the idea of the 18th century uh, Chinese and Japanese material, uh, this is all from Jingdezhen. So yeah, it's just someone digging a pit and uh, he found a whole stash anyway. So it just shows you the volume of imports and things coming in. So it's not just pepper because obviously, you know, we can't just live on pepper, right? So after you're, you're wealthy, what do you do, right? You, you can't make a pepper chair or pepper bed, or, but you buy things. Just like us today, it's uh, affluence, it's uh, this uh, affluenza, right? <laughs> That's what they call it, right? So you buy all these imported goodies from all over the world. So tons and tons of things are shipped there. So in this case, ceramics, they survive. Uh, yeah, I'll just talk a few more sites, then we can talk about the archaeology. I know, I, mean, I think I'm talking too much. Um, so, yeah, so just outside of, of Bantan, the, the, the town limits, there's another uh, Karaton, the Karaton Kai bonds right there. So you can, so you're, you're familiar with these really, so I, I don't need to orientate you. 
So here is a 19th century uh, print of this place, and, and it still looks very much the same. The gates are still there, so the, the stuff. So yeah, these are ruins. But this, surprisingly, is a 19th century structure. <laughs> So despite the fact that, you know, about 1808, when the Sultanate sort of went into decline, the, the Dutch came in and they actually occupied the place and they kicked the Sultan out of the, the uh, Suloswan Palace. They moved him to Serdang. Uh, uh, but he was sufficiently well enough to, uh, wealthy enough to build a palace for his mother. Right? So it's a big palace. Uh, very little archaeological work has been done. I think none. So there's still lots of opportunities. Another area which is, is wonderful is, is this Tasik Adi. Tasik, of course, uh, we know it means lake, right? Tasik Adi. Uh, this Tasik, so it's an artificial reservoir or lake up here. Uh, and if you can follow this line, follow my, uh, my pointer, it, there's an irrigation, not irrigation, it's an aqueduct that leads all the way into the palace. So there's this water, water resources are being tapped for the palace, right? So it's always for the palace. Uh, so it is how it looks like. Uh, you can visit, it's a little pleasure ground. Uh, you can rent those little uh, those swan boats and ride around it. Um, we, we don't really know when it was really built. There, there, there are a lot of conflicting data on it. So again, no archeology span is being done on this place yet. Uh, it's a two kilometers south to the palace. And along the aqueduct, uh, there's these three filtration, well, most, Researchers interpreted, or at least even the science says, they say, oh, these are filtration tanks. Uh, I don't know when this name came about. Uh, uh, Pangindalan, uh, Pangindalan, uh, Indel, for sediment. So, so people think there's a filtration tank to, to purify the water. And there are three of them. So one's got the Aban, Pute, and Imas. So Aban is red, Pute, white, Imas, gold. So, well, so most people think the theory is that as you slowly from the reservoir going towards the towards the palace, you know, it's, the water is reddish and muddy, and it becomes pure white, and finally it comes like gold by the time it rains. So we, I'm not too sure. So we most people are not too sure. Uh, there's no work being done someday. They've been talking about doing some work uh, since the 1980s. I'm I'm not sure whether in the last 10 years anyone has done any archaeological research on this thing. It might be a gravity station because of the distance. So they try to put the tanks to let it flow. But aqueduct is still around. It's still running by the main road. It gets in the palace. So okay. So now let's talk about the, the the two major features which any tourist who visit uh, Bantan will have to go. It's the Kraton uh, um, Solosuan and uh, Fort Spuwick, a Dutch uh, fort. And these are the two sites which uh, I personally did some excavation. Of course, the uh, Indonesian archaeologists have been digging since 70s and 80s, in 1980s, particularly. Uh, in different parts of Bantan, but these are the few places I'll, I'll just share a bit with you. So Solosan Palace, of course, you know, it's, it's a great site, right? It's, just, it's, it's right there, right? So it's not, we're not even talking about low-hanging fruit. It's just a fruit that's on the, front, on the floor. You just need to pick it up, right? It's like, the, the site is there. It's no-brainer, right? You just have to dig it. So, of course, we went to dig, and for us, our research is just trying to understand a bit more about how's the life of this elite of the Sultan, right? This rich, fabulous fella and his court. So we, we did an uh, excavation over the years. This, is, this, this image is from 2009, so we did a few small excavations. Uh, the the Solosan Palace itself is about um, maybe 300, by, 300, me 300 meters by 100 meters, about the size of the Padang in Singapore, so this for reference. So it's quite big. And uh, it, it was built, again, important date, right? Post-1680, uh, post-Civil War and was built in relatively European style. So apparently uh, there was a, a Dutch architect or engineer was hired and he, he built this place. Uh, there, there, over the years, there, lots of things have happened, but two major things that happened, I mean, there's all the palace fires and all sorts of things in different accounts, uh, was it was sacked in 1808 when the Dutch occupied the entire city. Um, there was Dutch garrison before that, but this time literally is a military occupation. And then finally, in 1832, the Dutch wanted to erase everything of the Sultanate to make sure there was no you know, potential future uprising or anything. They destroyed the palace and we only got ruins. So what do we have in there? We know there was a Dutch garrison being, um, being stationed there and in Fort Diamond. The, the, the Dutch call it Fort Diamond. So there's one component of, of this palace that is for the, the Dutch uh, European garrison. And in one of the earlier... Um, 
descriptions, we talk about the Dutch troops in, in the procession as well, right? So they, they were following along in, in this big ceremony as, a, as a guards of honor. Uh, the court and the administration, of course, have the place there. There's bathing pools, uh, a garden, a, sort of in European style, and then, of course, Dalam, the, the inner household. So for us, we wanted to find out a bit more about uh, uh, how was life like in there. We, we have very little little evidence of this place. This is one of those mysterious places that uh, most Europeans don't even enter the, the inner sanctum in a sense. So how was life like? I mean, there was a few accounts where dignitaries, uh, you know, VIPs were, uh, you know, the, like the, when the commis high commissioner from the Dutch uh, Governor General of Batavia was dispatched, so the, the Sultan hosted there. So there's a few images and a few accounts, but very, very small handful. So you can see his uh, female entourage, you know, right there, and they're holding a, a musket and all sort of a regalia, the golden pot and the golden the beetle box and things like that. Here's this, this uh, another group of entourage right there. So here's the foreigners are seated around the table. Uh, here's another, well, it's quite late, really. This is in uh, 1755. We know that it's not true, but it's a very fantastic type of uh, uh, romantic type image of how Bantan was like. I mean, look at the statue here. This, is, this looks like some looks like Shiva in the state of, you know, it's a, you know, it's just, with the multiple arms. Uh, so, so yeah, there's that sort sort of very fancy portrayal of, of, of you know there's a European imagination of how how Bantan would have looked like, but how does it look like from 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 archaeological data? So we did a few excavations. This is how Sulusuan looks like uh, from from the minaret. Uh, so you can see it's it's quite big, 300 by 100 meters. Uh, here is the interior of different ruins and different buildings, different. So one of our, our jobs is trying to find out different functional zones and activities, what's happening. Uh, here, oh yeah, you can see the minaret in the background, right? And that's a little site museum. So that's a little, little, little museum just across. I think you just pay one entry fee and you, you get to go to two places. It's not bad. So uh, here's a view and here's a pool. Here's a bathing pond. You know, like, I know it's a lot of algae, but cleaning up is still great as a spa. Uh, here, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, the, the water, the, the aqueduct leads into it, so there's all these uh, different types of sedimentation tank. So there's several of these water features and bathing pools and reflecting pools in, in, in this uh, entire structure. So you can see that quite a, a feat of engineering to bring in water from two kilometers away and to use it for the pleasure of the Sultan. So mind you, it's, it's not public works in that sense where they, they're giving water to everyone. It's, it's, there's always a lot of accounts about the uh, brackish water from the river and your well water is brackish, things like that. But for the palace itself, you know, for the elites, life, life goes on. You're insulated from, from everything else. So here's one of excavation just outside in the moat area from the, the, the wall of uh, the palace. Uh, this is Fort Spewick uh, to the north. Uh, surrounding Fort Spewick is a Dutch cemetery, uh, lots of... Uh, <laughs> Lots of, uh, uh, a lot of them died really young, uh, but it's, it's just the, the conditions in, in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, one of the, well, well, we'll come to that later. So yeah, here's a description of uh, Valentine in, in, in uh, near the 1700s. So he talks about Fort, uh, Fort Spielweek, and so we've got a lot of good descriptions of it, uh, how this thing works, and, um, but I wouldn't dwell on it, so let's push ahead. So here's how Fort Spirit looks like from the top. So the description actually fits. The little river that runs through it, here's a you know, Chinatown. And oh, there's a Chinese temple that's still there. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it, but this Chinese temple, again, they claim is one of the oldest in Java, but all temples and, and institu institutions like to claim they are the oldest, right? So for some reason, it's, oh, this Maya is the older than this guy. No, 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 we are here first. But they, they like that. So anyway, but uh, this is probably, uh, at least this structure itself, at least the earliest element that I can detect from the 19th century, but it might be much earlier. Uh, yeah, so that's the fort. Uh, that's how it looks on the inside. Uh, it's also conveniently used as a soccer pitch by the local uh, Bantanese team. So, so, we do. so people come and not only watch soccer, but they come and watch us digging. So that's a, so it's a kind of entertainment for them, right? It's also entertainment for us. So that's how it looks. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I couldn't find my hard drive where I had all the plans and drawings. So you have to make do with my 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 few my my diary, right? So here's the the area they've excavated the well, uh, and we believe that this is the kitchen area that we have excavated uh, right here. So that's the kitchen and the well. 
So we found a lot of materials relating to cooking, right? Uh, type of the, so you can see, yep, it's always very, very fun uh, when we excavate, lots of people come hang out with us. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so the type of artifacts we get, so yeah, it's, uh, every day we got hundreds and hundreds of kilos of things there. Uh, so here are the uh, different types of um, gin bottles, right? So alcohol, it's uh, consumed, of course, in Bantan by everyone. Uh, and then we also have, yep, so this is my workstation. We were looking through the artifacts and taking photographs. So you have a whole box of uh, clay pipes, you know, just like tobacco. So you have glass bottles, uh, bones, and all sorts of material. Uh, and we have a lot of ceramics. And ceramics is one of the interesting points for us to figure out what sort of uh, uh, trends or patterns of fashion, if you will, was popular. And so people do like things, right? So if uh, so and so Orang Kaya X bought this, oh, I also must buy, I must buy bigger. So they will, so there's this type of trends that you can follow through these ceramics. So I don't, I know you look at these things, you probably think to yourself, Chair, if tonight I go back home and as I accidentally washing my 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 plate, I piang, it breaks in and it's oh that's it. That's archaeology in a sense it is, right? So from all these things we <laughs> From all this, story, we can piece together what, 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 how was your, how was your lifestyle like? You know, if someone uses witch wood versus, you know, me, I use melamine at home. Right? So what does it mean, right? right? All those styrofoam guys, those guys keep recycling their own styrofoam, right? So they're two, two different type of people, right? Okay, so there are different things from uh, those. These are all Chinese. Uh, there's maybe one or two Japanese uh, from uh, Kyushu or uh, Arita. This is a Chinese, uh, late um, late Ming, early Cheng. So again, I. I, I couldn't find my that hard drive. So, but by looking at the different types of patterns and stuff, you can find. And a lot of people ask me, how do you know? How do you know how old it is? How can you tell it is from this period? It's from the designs. So things change, right? Just like our clothes, just like our cell phone, iPhone three, iPhone ten, or X or whatever. It's from a different time period, so it changed. So based on all these designs and things, we can tell you the time period. And from there, we can tell you how old the site or how old is layers. So here are European materials. Uh, they are 19th century. Most of these are all 19th century. So uh, British, uh, uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch, uh, uh, white earthenware. So these are probably Scottish. Here's a, a, a 18th century uh, wine jug. Uh, clay pipes. So clay pipes. So lots of people smoke. Lots of people smoking. In sorry, here. Yeah, again some images. So you can tell. See from the the designs and stuff like that. We we can figure out from which time period they, they came from. Uh, we know that from the company, uh, like uh, in this case, this is in 19th century from 1842 or something thereabouts. Uh, clay pipes. So clay pipes are great also because if you notice very, very carefully at the stem of these, uh, these Dutch guys are very helpful for archaeologists. They put their maker's mark and the stamps on it. And here with a little hand, this, we can tell you which manufacturer they are and when they are from. And from there, we can plot the depth of the site and figure out the entire assemblage that this layer is from the pre-Civil War layer, or this layer is from not the pre-Civil War, this is from this layer, this is from Sultan X, Sultan Y, or whatever. Well, but most of the days, as you can see, post-date the Civil War. So it seems that everything around this, of course, the fort and the thing were built post-date, so it's right. So the thing is, tobacco is, is one of the, I don't know where there's a vice back then, but you know, it's, it's very popular, there are reports of a Bantanese uh, princess smoking away. Uh, uh, it's the height of fashion, so everyone's like copying these um, practices. And animal remains, we got, remember we excavated by the kitchen and the, some other areas, and um, within areas, so we got all sorts of bones. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm trying to speed up a bit. But there's only a few more slides. Uh, these are coins, so they have Chinese cash, these are Chinese cash, and uh, local Bantanese tin coins. So Chinese copper cash, uh, these are nails, and some other sort of. Uh, the fishing hooks. So these are Bantanese coins. So they are minting coins. So the currency was real, was uh, the Spanish silver, right? Spanish dollar. Right? So the, the pieces of eight, right? One real. So, uh, but obviously you don't use a real to buy your coconut or to get a massage or something. So you have probably smaller denominations. So probably the, uh, the, the exchange rate varies over the, the few hundred years, but you know, but one real is equals to X number of string of, of all these things. So there's a very complicated uh, exchange rate. Right, so the, the general assembly is just from ceramics alone. You can tell us from various different places. So here in, in red, uh, you have things from Fujian, uh, from Zhangzhou. 
uh, from Jing Dojun. So these are different types of things. There's some Japanese material. They look very much like Chinese, but they're not. They're, 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 they're Japanese. They're, um, they're from Hizen, uh, from Arita Saga Prefecture in Kyushu. So these are things which they are copying Chinese uh, Chinese uh, ceramics because there was this demand for it. So these people, they're, and they're very good actually. They're not knockoffs, not, not cheap knockoffs, but they're very good as well. So they really look. Then we have local uh, local pottery. So you have the things like, you know, these we know, they're all made in Java, little uh, uh, little pots and cooking pots and candies and things like that. But we know that some are made in Bantan itself and some are made maybe from elsewhere imported. I'll, I'll come to that later. So there's a whole selection of different things that we're studying. Um, yeah, I'm kind of boring things again. Um, okay, I'm trying to see how it works. Okay, just in, in a nutshell, um, in a nutshell, it's over time we can tell from the few sites that we work here. Here is just from Solosan Palace. So Fort Diamond is also a part of Solosan Palace. And over time, the highest quality, the best regarded uh, ceramics porcelain from Jingdezhen um, has declined over time. Uh, possibly with the wealth of uh, due to the, the decrease in wealth or decrease in, in power of, of the Sultan. And over time, they make up, but they still want to maintain the semblance of, I still have a lot of stuff, right? So we buy the cheaper knockoffs now. So they're increasingly the more Fujian and Guangdong material uh, much later. But of course, it's not just because they may be cheaper or maybe they're not as good quality. But at that point in time, so the Chinese were exporting a lot more of these um, everyday wares. Right? So there's, there's, there's a slight decline in that. Uh, so my colleague, uh, um, uh, Kay, or Kay would, uh, she did a, a petrographic analysis on the local ceramics of all these uh, coarse earthenware. So these are like candies, right? You know, those little things you wash your hands with. So here's an image uh, showing a, you know, a Bantanese nobleman um, with his entourage, and they're carrying, uh, one of the, the servant girls is carrying his little candy to wash his feet and wash his hand, and let him spit after taking beetle. So we realized that there are two different types of, of things. They all look the same, right? They all look like this red little, Flower pots, right? <laughs> Effectively, so they're made locally, um, made locally at least in Java. We know from the local uh, uh, clay that uh, um, uh, B, so scientifically, you're matching the chemical uh, elements in there. It is made locally from the clay from the nearby area, and A, it's from somewhere else. So we also realized that something is interesting. It's like the A, it's a final quality product potentially from East Java, because they, we, we don't know where yet, but potentially from East Java, where they produce a lot of these very, very fine quality ones, and it's imported as a prestige object. But at some point in time, uh, because it's imported by distance, obviously, logically, it's going to be more expensive, right? Although it's just a flower pot or a candy, but it's going to be more expensive compared to something locally made. And of course, the Sultan can just order someone to make it as well, right? There's a threat of death, so you might not even need to pay, right? So that's just the other way. So this is local stuff. So the locals are bad. The local potters, although using different clay, but they're still trying to mimic the stuff coming out from further east in eastern Java. So at least outside, exterior-wise, the design and the burnishing, they try to polish it enough to make it smooth enough. So by if you compare it side by side, it's almost like a replica. So they were doing things like that. Mm. Oh, animal remains. So yeah, again, looking at the just from from Solosan Palace. In the early uh, 18th century, um, 17th century to, to early 18th century, there was still a very large consumption of uh, prestige uh, foods like buffalo and cattle. So buffalo and cattle uh, were expensive. Right? So in Bantan, it's like uh, for one cattle, it costs you about, uh, at that point in time, uh, oh, shoot, I can't remember what it is, seven, seven views or something like that, seven silver. So it's expensive, right? This expensive thing. Whereas in the inland, let's say you go all the way down to the south, to Anjia or something like that, or in the mountains, it's in about two or three wheels. So in the city itself, it's expensive. So that's the sort of value. So the Sultan and, and, and the elite inside were eating these things. And it was described by a few accounts, the Dutch accounts, that he served certain things, the beef and stuff like that. But over time, again, we see the drop. And we realized that to make up for protein, they consume more uh, fowl or, or, or chicken, or things like that. So there's a lot more chicken towards uh, the later part of the 18th century. And I'm not, uh... Right, so, yeah, no, I went a bit over time, I apologize. Um, yeah, so what do we know about Bantan? 
Actually, effectively, after today, a quick introduction of what's happening, and from the archaeology, we still know very little. There's still a lot of question marks, like when was the place found? When did they start having this thing? Uh, our focus so far, at least from the, the five uh, seasons that I worked there, was to really look at the lifestyle of the elite and post uh, 18, uh, 1684 after the, the, the Civil War. And look at the space, the demarcation between the elite and the non-elites, uh, the indigenous and the foreign. And from there, we realized there's certain prestige items, you know, for example, the, the candies, right? So there's, it looks like from somewhere else, but actually it's made locally. And we have things like um, uh, a lot of import of Chinese material or external material, and the consumption of uh, different types of, uh, of materials for, for uh, different types of animals for, for meals. So there are many, many different areas and themes that still remain unexplored. Uh, I've shown you uh, in the world we tour in the sense of the different sites that are still out there. Uh, most of them have never been excavated. So they're just sitting there. Uh, so we will, you know, I mean, it'd be interesting for someone to go and study the different ethnic quarters, the Gujaratis or the Chinese or anything. And the ruins are there, right? The Chinese mosque and all that. Uh, as you can see from, from the various walkabouts, uh, just digging in someone's backyard, there's lots of artifacts coming out from the ground. So, many things to be still to be done. Uh, maybe at some point I should go back. It's actually a nice little retirement place. Uh, uh, it's not that far from, 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 um, from, from Jakarta, and now they sort of it becomes a little bit more hipster. It's not so good. I can open my cafe and something. Huh? Right. So, anyhow. Uh, Thank you very much for joining me this evening. I, I, I do apologize for slightly going, going uh, above the time. Uh, this, these are my colleagues that I've been work, working with in, in, uh, in Bantan. And so I, yeah, so again, once again, thanks for joining me this evening and spending your time. Wait, we, we do have time for questions. I was a bit worried. Yeah. Please wait for the mic before you ask your question. We're going to pass the mic around because we are being, we are being taped. Um, also, please uh, don't forget to fill out the, or rather, click on this link for your feedback. Oh, yes. Thanks for the for the informative talk. I uh, We've, had, we've been to Bantan and uh, went and, look, uh, and, and just as a kind of a tourist to look at the sites. One thing that struck me after having visited central Java where with uh, many times, you know, with lots of Buddhist and Hindu ruins, Bantan didn't have, doesn't have any of that. And the ruins that we saw, it was a temple, it was essentially it's Buddhist, um, uh, 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 temples built by the Chinese, the Taoist temples. And at the museum, in your picture, there were some tombstones from the Qianlong period. Mm. But no Hindu or, or a, um, Buddhist temples, pre-Islamic -Islam, structures. Does that mean that Benton at the time was not as, let's say, developed as uh, Central Java was. So in other words, the, the, the structures were actually built just around the time when the Dutch arrived, so they would be attacking each other's uh, structures and, uh, and sacking them and burning them. Thank you. Right, um, a great question. This is one of the few things, I mean, for, for our work at least, and all the archeologists have so far been concentrating on the Sultanate period, so post 1525 and then post-European contact. So at least that's, that's the area we do. So in Bantan itself, yes, there are some artifacts, so like this big Nandi. So obviously it's a Hindu-Buddhist type of uh, religious iconography. It was found in a river. 
uh, it says that maybe <clears throat> we have uh, very little evidence for other things, for other things earlier, uh, in terms of, let's say, the sites that we're looking at, most of them are from the Sultanate period, right, it's from the European East v VOC, the East India Company period. So, it's, well, people haven't really been looking for something earlier. So that's the one thing. So statistically, it's just that, you know, you, we've been focusing on something else, so you, you haven't get a lot of reports. But, you know, like something like this, this is massive. So obviously, if it has to mean something. It, 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 it can't just be floating in a river, right? It, it, it was found there. So there must be some sort of settlement. The earlier accounts by the, the Ryukuns, the, the Okinawans, and by the Portuguese around 15, 1513, thereabouts, they talk about Bantan pre sultanate days. So there was something there happening. Now let's extrapolate and go back a few hundred years. Archaeological evidence wise, that's one of the few. And there are a few ceramic pieces, but the quantity is just very, very low. So I suspect that no one has really gone to look for it yet. Now, further, uh, it's, it's not a part of the topic of this talk, but um, about maybe 13 or, or 15 kilometers away south of Bantan in Bantan Girang, upstream Bantan, that's what it means, right? There is another big settlement up in the hills. And they have evidence from the prehistoric period all the way to uh, the Hindu, uh, Hindu Buddhist period. So they have things from, you know, from the ceramics alone and from coins and from links that we find. Uh, you, we can date them from that time period, you know, the 11th century to 14th century, they're about, so it's, it predates the Sultanate period. Uh, Karakotor, uh, where Karakotor is, there were a few, fortunately before the, the island exploded, there were, there were a few um, um, religious, religious iconography, again, big statues of Ganesha and a Shiva was found, a Karakotor. So within that area, yes, uh, there, there definitely are a West uh, Javanese uh, Hindu Buddhist kingdom before the Sultanate of Bantan. So even the Sajira Bantan specifically said, right, this mythical guy, this fellow came down here and conquered the, 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 this Hindu Buddhist uh, state or kingdom or settlement that's there. But there's very little work being done, that's all. Next question. Thank you for a fascinating speech. Um, my question is, has anything come down to us about the interaction between the Dutch and the locals? Uh, you know, in terms of maybe any commentary on their local custom with the traders perhaps, lifestyle. Are the traders considered elite or, or non-elite? Uh, anything you can share with us? Hmm, yes, um, okay, yeah. Uh, a lot of the, these accounts about interactions are from European accounts from these publications and things. So again, an exhibition has quite a few wonderful illustrations and books and things that uh, publish accounts of their... It's almost like a travelogue, right? It's almost like, you know, I wouldn't say it's like a lonely planet's guide, but it's someone who come up to the east, right? So I've been here, you know, some kind of thing, and this is what I saw and they explained. So some of them were very detailed, and some are really very, very accurate, and some are very scientific because they, they have a very naturalist kind of mindset. So most of this data about the in interactions between the Europeans and uh, the local people, so local again is it's very broad, right? who exactly are the local people, uh, are described there. Now from the archaeology, uh, that's why mm, I think in my last slide I, I mentioned that there's still a lot of things that we can, uh, as archaeologists or as historians, look into uh, is to, to look at other themes about what sort of interactions between these people. Now, were the Dutch merchants elite? Yes, they were the elite class of the Europeans. So even within the European classes there, they were the packing order, right? Right, so they were the elite in the Far East. So they might not be the elite back home. So if I remember, who is it now? I can't remember the quote and who is it, but it will come to me. You know, a lot of these guys going out to the Far East were really the the lowest end of the people, right? The, the those people who you, as they say in Singapore, you cannot make it, right? So in back home, right? So they come out here, they, and some of them were criminals. Some of them were given the options that you either go out there to join or the, the eastern, the, the eastern force or what. A lot of people were, were destitute as well. They have no choice. They have no other, no other option. I think so. They say I go out for a couple of trips. I come back as much, bring back as much goods as I. Even the sailors and the soldiers, they are entitled to bring, depending on your rank, the hierarchy, the social packing order and the military order, or the trading company order, you are allowed to bring X amount of goods back, your own personal chest, and some of them try to stuff as much as possible, right? And then you try to make your fortune there. So 
yeah, there's very little being done in terms of the interaction amongst the Europeans as well, or the Europeans and locals. Now, locals, what do you mean? Asians or the Bantanese itself? The most records that we have is always the dealings with the, the Sutan and the Orangkaya. Now, the everyday, everyday Joe, it's just very little accounts them. That's it. There are Bantanese records. Uh, there are a lot of court, court records, court cases and stuff, uh, but they tend to be a much later period, not from the early early 16th century or the European contact period, but much later period in, uh, you know, um, 17th, uh, particularly 18th century onwards. There are all these cases about inheritance and, you know, uh, so-and-so, I have this plot of Sawa and I want to give it to my descendants and this is worth how many reviews. There are a lot of these documentation about the social life in that case in, we can extract from there of the Bantanese itself. Now that's the Bantanese. Then how about the other populations of people that we have no clue about? We are finding snippets here and there. How do we find out about the Chinese? There's one or two Chinese cases of, 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 of documentation and visitors. But we're also finding out from things like uh, the records in, held in Nagasaki. So the Chinese junks from Bantan commissioned by the Sultan of Bantan will be sent all the way up to China, Guangzhou and stuff, then go up to Nagasaki and trade and bring back stuff, bring the pepper over and bring whatever, whatever they want back. And these guys left accounts of Bantan. Just the, the, the Tukukawa, uh, Tukukawa, Tukukawa uh, uh, Shogunic, they were very restrictive, right? They insisted on all these people to make accounts and every ship captain that comes, you must be interrogated about uh, about what's happening in your hometown. So we get, we get accounts from all these little bits and pieces. So of course, there are a lot of other people, right? So uh, I know my blurb, I didn't get a chance to talk about the you know, Japanese mercenaries in the early uh, 16th century. So there were quite a number of them. Uh, then there were other people from you know, India, the different coasts of India, the Malabar, Gujaratis. And this. So there, there are a few accounts locally about those guys. But if you look towards their merchant guild, let's say in South Asia, I suspect quite a few more information over there. So, but the wonderful site, so maybe it's, there's a lot of things to do. So it's a, it's a great retirement retirement place, right? You can sit there, try to investigate, and it has plenty of things to do. And it's, so yeah, right. So that's a very long-winded answer to your question. Shall we take one or two more questions? There's a lot more questions. Hello. <clears throat> um, you know, in Java, you can't go very far without seeing a volcano. And in one of the pictures, you show Gunung Karang. Um, in your work, have you come across any signs of volcanic activity affecting Bantan over that period of time? Because mm. it is quite an active part of the world for, for, for the volcanoes. A great question. Uh, fortunately for me, because I'm, I'm working on it within the last 500 years, so the, the, the volcanic eruptions uh, uh, for, my period, for my time period, there's none in the strata that we notice. But I suspect that if I probably we go further south, let's say to Anjur or to the coast uh, facing Karakato, right? Yeah, we might be able to find a whole, whole strata, a whole stratum of a volcanic ash and all those debris from the tsunami. So this, uh, some of my colleagues like Ed McKinnon uh, and, and, all, and others were working up in Aceh. That's another topic that we can talk about. And they have identified several different layers of uh, volcanic explosions and, and uh, resultant, then for, resultant uh, tsunami in, in the archaeological records. So you can even pack them to the years uh, over there. So for, for my case, no. But I'm sure, yes, I'm sure at some places, uh, if you go further, yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah. So the archaeologists looking at uh, earlier periods, maybe. Hi. Um, you, all right. Um, so you spoke about um, the relationship with the European traders and uh, foreign traders. How about the neighboring kingdoms? Have there uh, studies about and evidence about the relationship with the other sultanate? Ah, yes, Eric, that's another area that is, is worthy, right? So again, Sajara Bantan talks about how Bantan uh, the, the Sultan of Damak dispatched the, this wadi to, to Bantan and then he conquered the, with his army from Damak, Bantan, and set up this new Sultanate. And then later, Bantan claimed, uh, claimed sovereignty over uh, Charibon, the Sultan of Charibon. So there's this relationship between Bantan, Charibon, and Damak. 
Uh, so yes, they're, 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 um, archaeologically, I can't see it. You know, can't see all these things from Sarabon or anything. Yeah, but this is some area which you know historians and others can study uh, and any any dynamics between. So in order for archaeologists to study, they say the relationship between Cherubon and the Mount and other other principalities, if you want to call it, or even Batavia, we need comparative analysis. So we need to have sufficient excavation, let's say, in Batavia, the old town Batavia, the old port of Batavia, and uh, Bantanama. Yeah, I can compare. Say, let's say, Dutch fortress to Fort Spiewick to Dutch fortress in Batavia, Dutch uh, port in Batavia with the the where is it? The Dutch one is on the western side, right? So no. Eastern, Eastern, Eastern port, so I can compare it. So that's the only way we can do it. Uh, but so far, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't think anyone has, has done something like this. Yeah, but, but you know, if you are retired as well, you I welcome you to join me. And you know, someone was trying to sell me a plot of land there, we can build a house and. <laughs> right, so yeah, so lots of things can be done. So it's, it's just not been examined. One more, sure. Hi. Uh, in terms of uh, or historical his historical records, of course, you want to understand from the past from these uh, um, archaeological artifacts. But uh, I've read from other sources also as well. Uh, in terms of understanding the history in Southeast Asia, because uh, if you would like to uh, dig more about uh, Southeast Asia in terms of archaeological artifacts. Um, it could be not significant, uh, uh, quite significant. Uh, so according to this uh, uh, writing, that uh, uh, actually this part of the world is actually rich about um, what we call about uh, a text, histori historiography, in terms of histori historiography. So I just want to co uh, get your comments uh, in terms of uh, the significance of understanding the history in South Asia between uh, um, uh, this, the artifact and the text itself, because uh, you say just now the records of uh, 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 inheritance, uh, these are of course are the text. So, uh, your comment on that? Thank you. Uh, well, I, I hear several sub questions in there, but I'll, I'll try my best. This is a tough question for last one. Well, I guess uh, directly relating to to, to today's uh, talk, at least in Bantan, yes. So, as a historical archaeologist, we do rely a lot of text and try to compare the material data. As we know, uh, textual sources is just one element of it. You know, if people can lie, they can say whatever they want. Right? Uh, I'm not dissing the Sajara Bantan or anything, but remember, who, who commissioned the Sajara Bantan? The Sultan, right? So obviously, the, 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 the scribe, the person who, who writes it, and there's a specific objective for writing that genealogy, right? It's about the greatness of, here's my lineage. So, exactly. so there's certain things which they will cover only, and certain things they might not. And so even the European documentation, for example, we, I've just shown you a few illustrations, and anyone in this room, I mean, this is just so, a lot of romantic minds, uh, ideas are in there, of how the artist imagined Bantan, it looks like. They have, obviously the artist hasn't been there, right? There doesn't look like that. So in a sense, I wouldn't say that these documents and things can lie, but they might not depict uh, I won't say the truth as well, but it may not really depict what, what, what may be there. So through the artifacts, can we compare with it and see what it tells? We extract the data from, from historical sources and we compare it with the archaeological or, or the uh, artifacts and, and, and see how they, 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 they hold up. So in this case, for, for our work in Bantan, yes, uh, to your question, we do rely a lot on, on our historical sources and we try our best to, to match up or to compare or if they don't match up, what does it mean? What does it suggest? So we try to interpret or recreate or re, uh, what the, the society might be. Now the second part of the thing, which I think is a broader question in Southeast Asia at large. I, I, uh, well, I, I guess the short answer would be maybe if we can have more archaeologists and then we, we can have a share, yeah, but that's, a, so that's just a, that's a biased wish, right? So to understand Southeast Asia from, from different perspective, I, it, it's really a multidisciplinary thing. So you do need a whole spectrum of people from economic historians to social historians, you know, even architectural historians, uh, sociologists, linguists, archaeologists, anthropologists. Maybe not come together, but these, even for Bantan itself, you, you notice that even Sloasan Palace, we're only digging little tiny little excavation units. So if I were to dig up the whole site, it would probably take us another hundred years, right? So, so it's, it's just a small part of knowledge that we are, we, are, we are revealing. So there's still a lot more, but we can leave it for a future 
the future generation. Right? So, okay, I guess that should be. It.